war without accuracy. You can blow up the other guy's cities, you can kill a lot of people indiscriminately, but that's not fighting a war. Hmm? We did that at Dresden in World War II, and nobody feels very good about it. What you want to do is target weapons, not people. I, I don't want to kill any Russian schoolgirls. I want to kill his weapons and knock out his command and control centers. I want to basically tell the other guys, decision makers, that if you start the war, whatever else happens, you won't be in control when it's over. As the arms race intensified, the quest for greater precision drove the scientists on, particularly in electronics. From 1961 to 1965, every single circuit board and transistor in America was bought up by the missile program. Less than 20 years after the launch of the first V2, miniaturized electronics were delivering undreamt of accuracy. We came out with forecasts of accuracy attainable, which caused many people to raise their eyebrows, and I think they thought we were smoking opium or something like that when we predicted what could be done. But the Minuteman guidance system, self-contained, self-calibrating, took rocket science into a new age. Each version of it proved more precise than the last. The first long-range missiles had only been accurate to within five miles. The latest Minutemen are accurate to within 150 yards. The missiles were fully operational by 1961, only four years after the first Sputnik. The tables had been turned. Now the Americans had weapons accurate enough to launch a surprise attack of their own and destroy Soviet capacity to strike back. It seemed the missile men had finally given the United States the security it desired. The Soviet Union had two secret cities devoted to the science of missiles. Named after the greatest Russian rocket designer, Korolev City is still home to 5,000 scientists and engineers. Working in the nerve center of Korolev, Boris Chertok was stunned by what he learned about Minuteman. Minuteman, Soviet scientists set to work to try and copy Minuteman in conditions of total secrecy. Efraim Dubinsky was in charge of the project to invent solid fuel. Записи велись в тетрадях, ну в общих тетрадях, там типа амбарной тетради, на которой тоже обязательно был гриф, что эта тетрадь, гриф этот стал первый отдел, секретная. Я никуда не могу эту тетрадь выносить. Я сдаю это в машинописное бюро, тоже секретное машинописное бюро, где приемщица машинописного бюро принимает, отрывает у меня эти вот листы, а на корешках расписывается. То есть у меня ясно, что эти листы я не вырвал, не выбросил куда-то в корзину. Soviet designers saw they'd fallen years behind in the missile race. All their systems still relied on radio control, which the Americans could jam. They were liquid fueled, vulnerable to surprise attack. Desperate to catch up, the scientists called on all their patriotic reserves. Во время горячей войны тут Все для фронта, все для победы, это был совершенно ясный и понятный, доходящий до всех, так сказать, как говорят, до печенок возон. Во время холодной войны мы понимали, что война с огневых фронтов, с полей перенесена в лаборатории, цеха и заводы. И там развернулась эта самая горячая война. Within five years, the Soviets had perfected their own solid fuel missile, the RT-1.
America's massive scientific drive to build Minuteman hadn't guaranteed national security for long. RT-1 was a shade less sophisticated than its American rival, but its designers had reason to be pleased. Both sides could now obliterate each other with missile attacks. Neither side sought to develop an effective defense against them. Instead, they relied on the fear of nuclear retaliation being strong enough to prevent an attack in the first place. This approach threatened the center stage role in strategy that missile men had had since Sputnik. Contacts at 265. In theory, interceptor rockets could shoot down incoming enemy missiles. In practice, both sides knew they were too unreliable. And even if only a small percentage of nuclear warheads got through, the destruction would be catastrophic. Even research on defensive missiles could lead to further escalation. Building anti-ballistic missiles can stimulate the development of more and better offensive missiles. Because while I believe they won't work, there are other people who believe they will and who insist on building the, up the capabilities and the technologies necessary to stay ahead of them. So, so big programs to develop defenses lead to big programs to improve and even expand offense, and that is per se a bad thing. Successive American presidents therefore withdrew support from research into defensive missile systems. They looked increasingly to political negotiation and arms control. There is no way that we can adequately defend our cities. Uh, the only way that I have concluded that uh, we can uh, save lives, which is the primary purpose of our defense system, is to prevent war. This restraint on science outraged scientific hardliners, many of them based at Edward Teller's laboratory in California. America should win the Cold War, they argued, not just survive it. And win they would, if only the government would give scientists the tools to do the job. In 1979, they found a president eager to do just that. At first, Ronald Reagan's approach to the Soviet Union harked back to the height of the Cold War. Negotiation was useless, but American scientists could defeat the evil empire. We can either bet on American technology to keep us safe or on Soviet promises, and each has its own track record. I'll bet on American technology any day. President Reagan, first of all, has, had, had great faith in progress. He had great faith in young people, and he had enormous faith in, faith in scientists. He believed that scientists won World War II, or were amongst the major people who contributed to the success of World War II, and he found it utterly natural to call upon the scientific community to meet our needs now. President Reagan's response to the Soviet missile threat was a new scientific push designed to put rocket scientists out of business for good. SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, had been advocated for years by Edward Teller and his colleagues. SDI meant to meet a new and great danger. Sudden, unannounced, massive attack on practically anybody from any quarter. It seemed very important to do something about that. And it turned out in the long run that a very essential part of the defensive program would be 
to destroy the attacking missile as soon as possible after it got fired. An intercontinental ballistic missile in the first few minutes of its flight is like a Roman candle. It is not moving very fast. It is emitting enormous amounts of energy. It is visible from tremendous distances away. It is, if you wish, a sitting duck. The scientists behind SDI advocated putting laser weapons and interceptors into outer space. They'd monitor Soviet missiles, destroying them in space or even as they were launched. SDI threatened to make every Soviet missile redundant and powerless. At first, this new science existed only in the imagination of the new president and his advisers. But all that changed in March 1983, when Reagan asked American scientists to deliver the defense system of his dreams. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Tonight, consistent with our obligations under the ABM Treaty and recognizing the need for closer consultation with our allies, I'm taking an important first step. I am directing a comprehensive and intensive effort to define a long-term research and development program to begin to achieve our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. Suddenly, over $50 billion of government money was on offer for SDI research. Throughout the United States, there was no shortage of scientists keen to rise to the president's challenge. What happened, of course, was that each element of the Defense Department that was, had anything in any way an overlap with the president's speech immediately came up like a hungry bird and opened its mouth for money. They designed high-yield energy weapons, particle beam accelerators and lasers that could burn through the casing of enemy missiles. In New Mexico, where German rocket men had taught Americans the secrets of the V-2, lasers now demonstrated how SDI might work. Some of the weapons sounded close to science fiction, like the X-ray laser which used a negative shadow to destroy enemy missiles. Most objects, when you uh, shine light on them, uh, it's darker behind them. They cast a positive shadow, a real shadow like we're familiar with. Matter very far from equilibrium, properly prepared and carefully manipulated, will cast a negative shadow. It will be brighter behind it than, uh, than if it weren't there. Soviet anxieties were heightened by leaks to the press from scientists who once again found themselves in the national spotlight. This X-ray laser is a remarkable invention. And I am not allowed to, do, to tell you more. I wish I would be allowed, and I think I should be allowed to tell you more, because the Soviets know about it anyway in detail. The Soviets still believed the Americans were decades away from putting any effective weapons into orbit. The threat of Star Wars could just be a gigantic bluff. But the Kremlin's advisers realized that even the prospect of SDI menaced the Soviets with an arms race they simply couldn't afford. In Russia's run-down missile design centers, Soviet missile men were horrified at the scale of Reagan's plans for SDI. They simply didn't know where to begin. Когда появлялись другие виды оружия, ну, более-менее было ясно, с чем отвечать. Здесь на первых порах было неясно, что этому противопоставить. И, конечно, это вызывало чувство большой опасности. Предложение сводилось к тому, что надо и вновь вот Советскому Союзу 
чтобы не отстать в этих вопросах и успешно противостоять вот новой программе американцев, для этого опять именно вот на этих средствах, как тогда вот с ядерным ракетным оружием, на этих средствах нужно сконцентрировать экономические и финансовые возможности. Но э, в полном объеме, конечно, эти средства не были получены, а потом начались известные события. As the Soviet Union crumbled, massive arms reductions marked the end of the missile race. By 1995, 28,000 Soviet and American warheads had been removed from missiles or destroyed. The age of the missile was ending. Reagan scientists had been overtaken by political events. It left open the argument about whether science alone could have won the Cold War. In New Mexico, SDI tests have stopped. The program has been shelved. But some scientists still argue America must continue the science race even though it seems there's no one left to race against. Our technology today is valuable and will remain so, I believe, for the next five years. Technologies can change rapidly, probably not that rapidly, but in 10 or 20 years, our advantage may vanish. And even smaller countries could make developments, discoveries, that annihilate our advantage. Missile men have been using the same argument ever since the end of the Second World War. But from Pienemunde to the missile workshops of the Cold War, rocket science has never delivered quite the answers it promised. Today, a thousand Minutemen still stand in their silos, some of the most advanced weapons the Cold War could produce. But now there's no superpower to fire them at, no enemy who might spring a surprise missile attack. And it was politics, not science, that put the missile men out of business. Stalin's ambitious plans included the creation of a weapon of even more terrifying power, science at war with the H-bomb at 9.25 next Thursday on BBC Two.